Good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome to Teach Your Students How to Save Whales with Computational Thinking. My name is Sarah Glassman and I'm the manager of kindergarten to eighth grade curriculum at the Smithsonian Science Education Center. Sarah? My name is uh, Sarah Mallett and I'm a PhD student at George Mason University. I'm also a currently uh, a visiting scientist at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in uh, Dr. Matt Ogburn's lab um, called the Fisheries Conservation Lab. Um, I've been involved with um, several different Smithsonian uh, centers, uh, starting with the Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation as an undergrad, uh, which is located in Front Royal, Virginia. Um, I then also worked with uh, the Smithsonian um, Rain Station in Fort Pierce, Florida, and also the National Museum of Natural History. <clears throat> Um, this project that we're going to that we're going to share with you today started over a year ago when the Smithsonian Science Education Center began thinking about how to create elementary units where students use STEM and computational thinking to solve real world problems. That was when I learned about the research that Sarah Mallett was doing to protect whales. So we started collaborating and figured out how to make the type of research she was doing accessible to elementary students at a simpler level. So over the project, we both realized um, that we feel very strongly about how important it is to expose students to real world problems and inspire students to gain the STEM and computational thinking skills needed to solve complex problems surrounding sustainability. So we're really excited to share this project with you today. Um, before we start, there's a couple questions that we'd like you to think about for a minute. Um, so if you could please answer these on your own. And if you guys could also share answers in the chat, that would be great. So what do you think of when you hear computational thinking? And how, if at all, are you already integrating computational thinking into your classroom? Uh, Melissa, who is another curriculum developer at the Smithsonian Science Education Center, is monitoring the chat. So at any point during the presentation, feel free to share questions in the chat and she can address them or we can also all address them here as well. Um, and right now we're going to move forward and talk a little bit more about computational thinking, but we'll come back to the answers that you shared in the chat in a minute. Next slide. So what is computational thinking? Some people hear computational thinking and they think learning to use a computer. And computational thinking is definitely related to computer science. However, it's broader than that. Computational thinking is essentially problem solving. Computational thinking is commonly defined as the thought process involved in formulating problems and their potential solutions in ways that the solution can be effectively carried out by an information processing agent. Um, Tendi, go ahead and add that definition to the slide. Thank you very much. Um, that information processing agent can be a computer, but it can also be a human. So the computational thinking can be figuring out how humans solve problems with computers or how humans solve problems without computers, because humans can also be that information processing agent. And even if the problem is being solved by a computer, a human needs to program the computer to be that information processing agent. So one thing you'll notice about the unit that we're about to share with you is that students start by doing computational thinking without a computer. They're doing hands-on problem solving. Then later in the unit, they extend that hands-on computational thinking to figure out how a computer could more effectively help solve the problem they're working on. Next slide. So there's not an agreed upon definition of exactly what computational thinking includes, but most researchers agree on the following cognitive competencies. And as I go through these, Think back to the questions that you answered at the beginning about using computational thinking in your classroom. Maybe some of the definitions I'm going to share here might get you thinking about some other ways that you're using computational thinking in your classroom already. So the first uh, computational thinking skill or competency is decomposition. 
And this is breaking down complex problems into more manageable subproblems. The next one is algorithms. And this is using a sequence of steps to solve a problem. So this could be a sequence of steps that a computer is following to solve a problem, but it can also be a sequence of steps that a human is using to solve a problem. So for example, a recipe to make cookies, or maybe directions to build a birdhouse. These are both examples of algorithms that humans would follow. Um, the next one is abstraction. This means reducing the complexity of a problem and focusing on what's important. So this includes looking at data, organizing data, trying to figure out ways to look at the data so you can figure out what's important. This includes um, looking for patterns and also modeling different aspects of a problem to try to figure out what's important. And then finally, automation. So this is determining if a computer could more efficiently help solve that problem. So now that we have further defined computational thinking, what other examples of these skills are you already doing in your classroom? So go ahead and share that in the chat. Um, and I'm just looking. It looks like we already have people sharing some great ideas about how they're already doing computational thinking in their classroom, like think like a science problem solving or inventing scenarios. Um, using data to draw conclusions as an example of abstraction. Yeah, so this is really great. It looks like people are already doing a lot of different examples of computational thinking in their classroom. Oh, this is good. Computational thinking in cross-curricular coding challenges. That sounds really cool. Um, okay, great. So uh, go ahead to the next slide. So one thing that you might notice is a lot of these computational thinking competencies overlap quite a bit with science. So the unit that we're going to share today, students are also using science in conjunction with computational thinking. And specifically, the work that students are doing is aligned to the next generation science standards which some of you may be familiar with, but if not, no worries. The Next Generation Science Standards describes three dimensions, which are the disciplinary core ideas, the cross-cutting concepts, and the science and engineering practices. So disciplinary core ideas are the discipline-specific core science content. So for example, populations live in a variety of habitats, and change in those habitats affects the organisms living there. This is a third grade life science core idea that's part of the unit that we're going to talk about today. Um, and sometimes science learning in classrooms is just focused on this content. But the next generation science standards put equal focus on what's called the cross-cutting concepts and science engineering practices. So cross-cutting concepts are science, con are science concept concepts that cut across all science disciplines. So for example, patterns and cause and effect. And these are both cross-cutting concepts that you will see how students can use as part of the unit we're gonna to share today. And science engineering practices, these are practices or processes that scientists engineering engineers use to explain phenomena and solve problems. So for example, developing and using models and engaging an argument from evidence. So these are both science engineering practices that, once again, you'll see are part of the unit that we're going to share today. Um, next slide. So computational thinking, as we have defined it, is not described in one set of standards, but it's part of three different national standards. The Computer Science Teachers Association K-12 through Computer Science Standards, the ISTE student standards, and the next generation science standards. So one of the science engineering practices in the next generation science standards is specifically called using mathematics and computational thinking. So that's an obvious overlap between the next generation science standards and computational thinking. However, six out of eight 
of the science engineering practices, and three out of seven of the cross-cutting concepts also overlap with computational thinking. So there's really a much bigger overlap than you might think when you're just looking at the list of practices and you're like, oh, one out of eight of these practices overlap. Really, there's a much bigger overlap than that. So based on that amount of overlap between the science practices and computational thinking, science time is a great time to incorporate computational thinking in the classroom. Next slide. So the unit that we're going to talk about today is one of two new units in our Smithsonian Science for Computational Thinking series. Both units are aligned to the next generation science standards, as well as the computational thinking standards that we just talked about. Both units are freely available on our website. And the unit that we're going to dive into today is called Protecting Whales. It's specifically designed for third grade based on reading level and also on the specific disciplinary core idea that's in the module. However, it's good. You could use it, I think, in grades two through five. Um, and I think Melissa just added a link to the landing page for the unit in the chat. This landing page includes all the resources you would need to teach this unit in your classroom. Next slide. So both the unit that we're going to talk about today, as well as the other unit in our series, are problem driven. This means that the work that students are doing in the unit is in service of solving a problem. So here's the problem that students are presented at the very beginning of the Protecting Whales unit. Students are asked to share, what do you observe here? And also, what do you think is causing what you're observing here? So go ahead and put your answer to both of these questions in the chat. And while folks are responding in the chat, um, maybe we can walk through some of the images to note a few observations that researchers like myself would also document and attempt to determine um, what may have caused these injuries um, observed in each of the photographs. Um, Sarah mentioned earlier the cross-cutting concepts such as pattern recognition and cause and effect, and we can apply those same concepts in studying these images. Um, as a whale researcher, I often study images uh, like these to determine uh, what species it is um, and try to understand the source of the injury that may have led to its death. Um, so in the image on the top left, uh, there's a dead right whale on the beach with a series of parallel wounds or lacerations. Um, in the image on the top right, there's an alive humpback whale free swimming with an injury above the right pectoral flipper. Um, and it's exposing the underlying blubber. In the image on the bottom uh, left, there's a team of researchers documenting a dead humpback whale on the beach and an event that we call a stranding. Um, these events provide an, a unique opportunity to study a species uh, or individual that spends a majority of its life underwater. Um, in the image on the bottom right, there's another alive injured whale um, with similar parallel slicing wounds, um, similar to the image on the top left. <clears throat> so looking at the uh, chat, looks like people are chiming in um, and it looks like folks are saying essentially boats, um, uh, maybe a skin issue, um, an ill or injured whale. Um, all, all good, uh, all good suggestions. Um, and also, it looks like people have some ideas about what they think caused injury to the whales. So some possible ideas are maybe an entanglement or propeller damage or ghost gear. Ghost gear would be fishing gear that is not been recovered and is left in the ocean, even though it's no longer being used for fishing. Um, also, fishing gear is another idea that people are sharing. So people definitely have a lot of great ideas that you're sharing in the chat. Thank you so much. Yep, those are those are great. Um, so the top left picture provides a really clear example of wounds that we often see resulting from uh, a propeller. Um, so basically a motor from a boat um, hitting a whale. And um, these parallel slicing wounds um, are indicative of a boat strike. Um, so basically the propeller hits the whale and, um, and we'll see in the next video how um, that a propeller might elicit that, um, that type of injury. 
Um, you can also see additional images. So all of these images here um, uh, are associated with um, uh, boat strikes. But um, the broader um, conservation issue with uh, large whales is that um, boat strikes, um, such as those observed in these images and entanglement in fishing gear, like um, the participants um, put in, in the chat, are the leading causes of mortality for whales. And so this is basically the, the um, premise of um, this module is that this is a real, um, a real world conservation issue um, that we're, you know, it's very complex, but to be able to get, you know, these young stakeholders involved early to try to figure out problem solving um, uh, is, is, is what this module is all about. I, I also want to mention that Rebecca said in the chat, which I definitely agree with, this is a great opportunity to bring in some art observation strategies, like close looking and responding. That is a great, that's a great point. Um, I also wanted to mention that at this point in the module, uh, the teacher does not necessarily validate or negate any of students' ideas about what they think caused the problem. So this is definitely like a, you know, we, we're talking more about what did cause the problems um, and, and validating that. But in the module, this would ju really just be their initial ideas. Sarah, should we go to the next slide? Sure, the next slide. So um, this, uh, this slide and this video um, in the top left shows a boat propeller. And um, as I mentioned, you see these parallel slicing wounds in the image on the right-hand side. Um, but this propeller, um, oftentimes, particularly large vessels, boats, um, they can really cause uh, damage and injury and mortality to large whales. And you can see in that image on the right-hand side with those, those wounds along the body, um, how that propeller might create that uh, injury if it um, if it hits a whale. So um, yeah, this is one of the leading causes of mortality for uh, large whales, and this uh, provides a really great example to show how those injuries might actually occur. Next slide. So in the unit, after students share their initial ideas about what they think happened to the whales. Then they're going to learn a little bit more about a whale's life. So they play a game that simulates the life of a group of whales. So the board on the left is their game board. The game starts with eight whales in the calving ground. Students spin a spinner for each whale to see what happens to them. And the whales move back and forth between the calving ground and the feeding ground. So an example of one of the spinners they use is in the lower right. Um, sometimes new whales are born, sometimes whales die, and students keep track of what happens over 10 years on the data sheet that you see in the upper right corner. And just to provide a little bit more context for um, the diagram on the left-hand side, um, most baleen whales, they undergo these long-distance migrations um, between the feeding grounds and the cold, nutrient-rich waters um, that support high densities of prey. Um, and then calving grounds and tropical waters. So this diagram on the left sets the stage for students to understand how whales uh, move or migrate between these two ecologically important areas critical for their survival. Next slide. So after playing the game, students revisit the initial problem of the injured and dead whales, and now they might have some new ideas about what happened to the whales based on what happened to their whales in the game. Um, and this is an important part of the problem-driven model, that students continually revisit the problem that they're working to understand and solve. So now when students revisit that problem, they might think the whales might have gotten hit by boats, or they were caught in a fishing net, or they swallowed plastic. Um, and as part of the unit, at this point, the class focuses on the problem of whales getting hit by ships and boats. Next slide. So to understand when and where whales are located or are moving um, or migrating between these calving and feeding grounds, um, researchers document the precise location of whales using a GPS or a global positioning system. And they take pictures um, uh, such as in the image here, 
um, in where I was documenting Arabian Sea humpback whales. And we do this to basically um, confirm what the species is, but also what the, um, in some cases, the individual whale. Um, and uh, I'll talk about this in, in the next slide, specifically how we're able to do this um, through photographs. Um, but basically, researchers can document whales from boats, planes, uh, drones, and satellites. And I study whales from each of these different platforms to track the whale movement, um, to also understand the habitats that they use, and to try to solve the problem of whales being hit by boats as they migrate between their feeding and calving areas, and in areas also that are heavily utilized by people on boats. Um, next slide, please. So one way to study whale movement is to use the unique combinations of coloration, um, scarring, and shapes of the flukes or the tail, such as in the image uh, shown here. This is similar to how um, human fingerprints are used to uniquely identify individuals. Um, this humpback whale tail um, is, uh, is, is exactly how we are able to identify individuals. So as you can see, the pointer um, this this uh, trailing edge of the tail um, that is is unique to an individual. Also, what's unique to an individual humpback whale is the coloration pattern. So you can see that along the tips, it's it's uh, a majority of white coloration, whereas in the center of the tail, it's uh, mostly black. Um, and these uh, combinations of coloration, scarring, and the the trailing edge. Um, is, is how we're able to identify an individual. Um, so using photo ID, we can track whale movement and it allows us to better understand when whales are using areas that are frequented by boats and therefore may be more at risk um, with negative interactions with these boats. Um, next slide, please. So now we're gonna give you a chance to practice your whale identification skills. So these are six different pictures of whale flukes that have been taken in different locations. So if you can figure out if any of these are the same whale, you'd be able to figure out some information about when and where those whales are at different times. So look at these six whale flukes. Try to figure out if any of them are the same whale. And if you do think any of them are the same, go ahead and put the matching pairs in the chat. So this is exactly what we um, we do, um, the same exercise that you're currently working on. Um, this is how we are able to identify individual whales, map their movement over time and over geographic space. And um, so this pattern recognition um, is is uh, a key to this um, to this exercise. So some of the features that you can use to match these tails, I mentioned a little bit in the last slide. But the amount of white, if you, if you recall the image um, in the previous slide, there's a lot more white in the image. Um, in these images, um, there's uh, you basically use the um, uh, amount of white versus black on the underside of the tail, at least for humpback whales. Um, you, you can use scarring, like you may see from the teeth of an orca, um, which we often see on humpback whales, and also the shapes of the flukes or the tails. Um, so, for example, some are very broad, like in number two, while others are more narrow, like in number one, the, the flukes or tail that is. Um, you can also use the trailing edge, like I mentioned, or that we, sh we showed you in the previous slide, um, which is very unique to each animal and it has lots of uh, distinct characteristics. <clears throat> All right, so let's see how everyone did with whale identification. Uh, you may have noticed that whale one has a unique mark on the right side of the fluke, and whale six has that same unique mark on the right side of the fluke. So this is the same whale. You may have not also noticed that whale two has what looks like a thin upside down check mark on the left side of the fluke, and whale four has that same thin upside down check mark on the left side of the fluke. Um, so these are also the same whale. And then whale three, which has been nicknamed Picasso by observers and scientists, has what looks like some Picasso style white markings. 
and whale five has those same white markings. And a lot of people got that one, whales three and five. That, that, that fluke is pretty unique. Um, so as researchers can build data sets of observations of the same whale, they can better understand when and where whales migrate over the year. Um, this work that you just did, looking for similarities and differences in patterns in order to identify images of the same whale, is part of the work that students do in the unit to sort whale observational data. And this work is also an example of how students use that patterns cross-cutting concept in the unit. All right, next slide. And Sarah, and there's a couple questions also that maybe after I do a couple slides, you, you might want to address in the bottom of the chat. Okay. Um, Okay, so in the unit, students get 16 images of whale flukes. Each of the images are labeled based on the date and the location that the observation occurred. Um, students sort the cards in multiple ways to both broadly see the migration pattern and also to see the movement of individual whales. Next slide. All the whale data that students use in the unit is from a population of humpback whales that live off the coast of North America. And when students sort all the data by the time of year that the different whales were observed in different locations, they identify the pattern that the whales were in Mexico in the winter and then migrated to the California coast for the spring, summer, and fall. Next slide. Students also sort data by individual whale. They use the pattern on the whale flukes to put all the images of the same whale together, just like you just did. And then they figure out that those 16 images come from four different whales. And then each student looks at the specific migration pattern of one of those whales and see if it matches that big picture migration pattern that, that they identified by looking at all the data. Next slide. So students use data from their individual whales to develop a model to show how the whales move over the year. Students have freedom to develop these models on paper or using objects to represent whales or using themselves to represent whales. And then, so students get, get the opportunity, you could see in the picture there, those students had an opportunity to uh, use stuffed animals. They're using stuffed animals to represent the whales and move them on a map, or they could make a map and label where the whales are with a sticky note. And so after they make a model of their whale movement, then they see where ship traffic is heaviest. So it show if, if you could show that picture of the ship traffic, yeah. So then they have to create a model where they're both considering where are the whales and where are the ships. So here, students are using that practice that we talked about of developing models. They're not just learning where the whales and ships are located, but they're developing their own model to better understand this problem. And then they use their model to make their own claim about where the problem of whales getting hit by ships is probably the biggest problem. So students are not being told where this is a problem. They use their own models and evidence to identify where it's a problem. So this is another example of students using one of those science practices. They're, they're constructing a claim and using evidence from models and data to support it. And one of the reasons we picked um, this area specifically um, in the image on the right-hand side, um, it, the, best, the image basically shows vessel traffic. And um, you can see the red areas are where the vessel traffic is the uh, most dense. And so these areas um, with high vessel traffic are shown in are shown in red, and they're um, right off of San Francisco in LA, off of the west coast of uh, California. And these are areas that are frequented by vessel traffic. Um, and these are also areas where whales move along their migration between the feeding areas in the north and the calving areas in the south. And um, 
So this area is really a prime area for students to study whales being hit, hit by boats, um, as this is, you know, a real world issue that we, you know, we as, you know, researchers and conservationists and managers are trying to, uh, you know, figure out how to solve this problem. Next slide, please. So let's go back to those computational, comp computational thinking competencies that we talked about at the beginning. So what computational thinking competencies have students used so far in the unit? So go ahead and put your answers in the chat and we will review the answers shared in a few minutes. So in the next task, students read a story called Whales and Ships to better understand the problem of humpback whales getting hit by ships and possible solutions. Students learn about three strategies to address the problem. First, they learn about creating areas where ships are required or recommended to move at slower speeds. And we're gonna call this slow, slow go zones. Second, they read about areas, creating areas where ships are not allowed to go. We're gonna call this no go zones. And then finally, they learn about using real time databases that people can record observations of whales and then ships can check to see if there's recent whale observations on their route. So we're gonna call this whale reporting. Next slide. Students can also read Up Close with a Marine Scientist to learn more about Sarah's career as a marine scientist and conservationist and see how the work that they have done in the unit mirrors her work. And if your students read the story, you can tell them it's about a scientist that you met. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, so let's see um, what ideas people have shared about how we have already used computational thinking in the unit so far. Um, it looks like people said data analysis, definitely. Um, modeling, they're definitely doing modeling, data analysis and modeling, which are part of abstraction and pattern recognition, definitely, yes. What they've done so far is very heavy on abstraction. Um, and now as they move into the last part of the unit, students are gonna use automation or using a computer to more efficiently solve a problem. Next slide. So in the final task of the module, students use a digital simulation called Whale Protection Core to see more details about where whales and ships are likely to be found along the west coast of North America. And then students can test different solutions. So the simulation uses real whale data and real ship data, just like students used in their own physical models to research the problem and propose solutions. But now with the help of a computer as the information processing agent, students can view more data and more easily find the problem areas. Further, students can use the simulation to see how the probability of ship strikes will increase or decrease based on different solutions that they put in place. So I'm gonna go through an animation of this simulation in a minute. Um, I think Melissa also put a link to the simulation in the chat. So if you wanna check out the simulation directly, you can also do that. Um, so in the simulation, you'll notice that students are going to get to test three different possible solutions. And they're the same solutions that we talked about from the reading. So students can test no-go zones where ships are not allowed to go. Let's just, sorry, can we just hold on the animation for a minute? Maybe we can't. <laughs> um, okay, so they're gonna test um, no-go zones where ships are not allowed to go. They're going to be able to test slow zones where ships are required or recommended to travel at a slower speed. And finally, students can implement whale reporting, um, which is implementing that system of real-time whale observations entered in a database so that ships could potentially make adjustments to navigation and avoid areas where whales are observed. 
So in the simulation, you'll see they can test each of these solutions separately, and then they can create comprehensive solutions that put these solutions together. Um, so, okay, you can go ahead and play the animation now. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, another thing you'll notice about the simulation is it can be standalone. So it can be used with the um, with the unit, but it but it also provides context to students. So if they just played it without doing the unit, they would get some background information. So Captain Chelsea is a ship captain and she's trying to get her cheese where she wants it to go. And Herbie the humpback whale is also sharing information and um, as you can see here, students have a chance to um, look at the whale data and the ship data so that they can see a big picture of where, where the whales are and where the ships are. And then Herbie and Chelsea are going to explain a little bit about those three solutions that we just talked about. So no-go zones, slow zones, and whale reporting. And then students get a chance to make a prediction. So what do they think might help the best? And then they choose where they would like to specifically try to implement their solution. Um, and then they're gonna try each thing separately so they can see the impact. So they'll have a chance to try no-go zones, then slow zones, then whale reporting, and then they'll have a chance to put them all together. And where, when they're choosing where to put those no-go zones, they can see where are the whales and where is the heavy ship traffic. So, you know, try to put some of those no-go zones in places where the whales are, but you gotta be careful because if you put them where the heavy ship traffic is and then the ship can't get into the port, then you're gonna have trouble delivering all your goods. So they can see what how their solution did this one didn't do that great at helping the whales uh did okay with shipping so maybe add a little bit more no go zones and see how that impacts our result all right so we did a little better with helping the whales, but that solution did not really let the ships do the deliveries they needed. So let's see what we can do by adding some slow zones. So let's cover these areas that have a lot of whales and also have high shipping traffic with slow zones and see if we can make a little bit of a difference. Okay, so all the cheese still got delivered but we still only got two out of five for reducing the amount of whales getting hit by ships. So let's see if we can add some more slow zones. Okay, we did a little better. Now we got three out of five on the number of whales saved. Okay, so now we're gonna try out whale reporting. Whale reporting is not specific to an area. It's just rather um, how much resources you're basically investing into this whale reporting program. So, you know, if you invest as much as you can, you can see that that will, you know, make a difference, but on its own, you're still only saving two out of five whales. So when we go to build a comprehensive solution, we can combine whale reporting with these no-go zones and slow zones. So now we're gonna try adding some no-go zones in some places and add some slow zones in that area that has that very dense shipping traffic. The ships are trying to get into the port, but also there's a lot of whales there. So let's see if we can add some slow zones there and add some whale reporting. All right, we got four out of five on the whales saved and four out of five on the cheese delivered. So this is a good solution. We're gonna save this solution and then we're gonna get an opportunity to build a couple other solutions so that in the end we could compare them to each other and see which one we wanna do. All right, let's try just putting a whole bunch of slow zones right near the coast. We're not even paying attention to the whale and ship data right now. So we're throwing in all these slow zones right by the coast. And how about we throw some no-go zones in so you can kind of get a sense of what might happen if you don't pay attention to the whale data and ship data. 
all right, that is not a great solution for the ships because no cheese got delivered. It's good for the whales though, but we need, we need a balanced solution. So let's try again. Add some slow zones to that. Okay, so we did not do very well helping the whales on that one. All right, let's try one more solution where we add a bunch of slow zones right near the um, busy area and put some no-go zones down in the bottom here and we'll do a bunch of whale reporting. All right, that's good. Four to five on the whale saved and four to five on the cheese delivered. So looks like solution one and solution three both have good results, but solution one is a little less expensive. Still did cost quite a bit of resources though. So we'll pick this one as the best one. And students have a chance to share, you know, why did they pick this solution? Uh, and then at the end, they get a chance to look at their original prediction and the solution that they picked and why they picked that solution. So uh, next slide. All right, so um, let's go back to some of the questions that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Um, how have your ideas about computational thinking changed? Maybe you now realize some ways that you're already integrating computational thinking into your classroom. And also take a minute to think about how you might want to integrate computational thinking into your classroom moving forward. Also, if you have any final questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we will um, try to address them. And um, I, I did want to go ahead and share a few more resources that you can get from the Smithsonian. But Sarah, do you want to talk about some of the questions that people already added to the chat right now, or do you want to do that at the end? Sure, I can, um, uh, there's a, there are a few questions I can um, address now. I think um, Melissa may have put some in text in, in the chat. Um, but one of the questions that was uh, posed was, um, let's see, um, are shipping companies able to enclose cage the propellers to help prevent injury? Um, I am not aware of uh, efforts to do so. Um, I recall someone, uh, you know, many years ago mentioning this as well, but I don't know that that's um, necessarily on the table for some of these shipping um, companies. Um, so it's a great question, and I can't say I have the answer to it, but I, I, I'm not aware of efforts to to do that. Um, Another question is, uh, do you know if the injury shown in the initial set of images are from commercial fishing or recreational boats? And um, it's really difficult to be able to identify um, what, uh, what uh, specific category of boat that may have um, attributed those wounds. But one of the tools that we do have is to be able to um, uh, measure the distance between those parallel slicing wounds um, that can then give us um, an idea of estimates, the estimated size of the vessel based upon uh, maybe how quickly the vessel was moving or how large the propeller of the boat is and try to like reconstruct um, uh, how big that vessel may have been. But attributing it to recreational versus commercial um, often in most cases is quite difficult. Um, one other question that I see is, um, uh, is it because the boats are getting close to the whale or are the whales approaching the boat? Um, and the, I guess the, the, the simplest answer is that, um, you know, along these, along the whales migratory route, these whales are encountering boats. Not only um, are they are at risk of being hit by a boat, but they're also constantly exposed to the sound, the noise of the vessel, um, the noise, um, there's, you know, all sorts of uh, ocean noise, but they're constantly bombarded, per se, with uh, vessel traffic um, along their migratory route. And whether it's recreational or commercial, um, cargo ships, um, even whale watching boats, um, you know, are, are constantly approaching whales, um, you know, between their feeding grounds and their calving grounds. So there's lots of opportunity for whales to be hit by boats. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very challenging and complex 
problem because these, you know, these whales are constantly being, um, you know, exposed to vessel traffic. But we know that in these areas that they're more likely to be um, along the migratory route when they're in higher numbers and where vessel traffic is high, such as in this example of LA and San Francisco, Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, we know they're at greatest risk of being hit by boats, particularly at the times um, when they're migrating through. So we can really, you know, focus uh, conservation management efforts um, at those at those times. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and as I said before, if you want to throw any other ideas in the chat for how you might plan to integrate computational thinking into your own classroom moving forward, um, I also just wanted to acknowledge the contribution of many organizations to make this project possible, but, but especially the Department of Defense STEM, whose mission it is to inspire, cultivate, and develop exceptional STEM talent. Um, I also just wanted to share some additional resources that people, if you like this resource, you might like some other resources from the Smithsonian Science Education Center. Um, I think Melissa is putting some links in the chat that um, will take you to these resources. So as I said before, Protecting Whales is one of two units in the Smithsonian Science for Computational Thinking series. And everything you need to teach both the third grade Protecting Whales unit and the fifth grade Weighty Problem unit is freely available on the Smithsonian Science Education Center webpage. Besides Whale Protection Corps, Smithsonian Science Education Center has many other STEAM digital interactives for created for students in kindergarten through middle school, and they're freely available on our website. And then finally, Smithsonian Science for Computational Thinking is designed to supplement Smithsonian Science for the Classroom, which is a cohesive K through five curriculum aligned with the next generation science standards and many state standards. So this series is for purchase and sold by Carolina Biological Supply Company. It includes print materials, kits of materials for hands-on learning, and a digital learning management system. It's currently implemented in about 30 school districts across 43 different states. And if it is something that you or your district is interested in, please contact Carolina Biological Supply Company. Um, next slide. So if there is, um, actually maybe we'll, we should see, we should take a couple other questions. It looks like there might be a couple. One question is, is the simulation only in English? Now, I, now I, I was gonna say no, but that's not right. It's available in Spanish. I just remembered that. Yes, no, the simulation is available in Spanish, but I don't know if we have the Spanish one posted yet. So it should be available in Spanish soon. <laughs> um, Sarah, are there any other questions that you see in the chat that you want to answer? But we all also, I think, close to time. Yeah, there's a, a great question about is, um, is the mortality rate similar across species? And um, it, it varies. Some species are um, spend more of their time at the surface of the water based upon their feeding ecology. So for example, in North Atlantic right whales, they um, skim feed right at the surface and they spend a lot of their time just below the surface. Um, and so some species like North Atlantic right whales are more um, at risk, for example, vessel strikes um, on the West Coast. Um, humpback whales, fin whales, um, they are also, and blue whales are also, um, you know, uh, are, are at higher risk given, um, you know, some of their feeding ecology and characteristics that um, are uh, iconic per se of, of each of these different species. So yes, different species are at uh, greater risk than others. And the North Atlantic, North Atlantic right whale is a great example given its feeding ecology. Great question. And I also just remembered the answer to the Spanish question. When you're playing the simulation, there is a tool box that you can change it to be in Spanish. I was like, I know we worked on that Spanish. Where is it? Yeah, that's where it is. It's within the simulation. You can switch it to Spanish mode. So 
I think we're at time, but thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your time and interest in thinking about how to expose students to real world problems that inspire them to gain the STEM and computational thinking skills they need to solve those problems. So thank you.